Well, over the weekend, U.S. Special Forces conducted two highly secretive raids on terrorism targets in Africa. The first happened at a beachside compound in Somalia, where Navy SEALs with the elite SEAL Team 6 were apparently trying to capture one of the men behind the recent attack on the Kenyan Mall, which terrorist group Al-Shabaab took credit for. The second happened just hours later in Tripoli, Libya. SEALs were looking for a man who's wanted in connection with the 1998 bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. One of those operations was successful. The other one was not. U.S. officials confirmed the capture of Nazia Abdul Hamid al rokai otherwise known as Abu Anas al-Lib, in Libya. However, the SEAL team that stormed the compound in Somalia came under heavy gunfire and was forced to retreat without al-Shabaab leader Abdul Qadir Mohammed Abdul Qadir, otherwise known as Ikrima. Now, these two raids bring up a number of questions when it comes to U.S. counterterrorism efforts. Are we seeing a shift in policy? Why was it so important to capture these men alive? And will Abdul Anafs Alib be tried in New York courts? Joining me now to shed light on some of these operations is Colonel Morris Davis. He's a law professor at Howard University. Thank you so much for joining me. Hmm. Now, you've been really outspoken on social media over the weekend about these two raids. What are your initial thoughts? Well, I think you have to look at them separately. The raid in Somalia uh, was conducted by military forces, coordinated with the Somali government, and appears to have been conducted in accordance with the law of war or international humanitarian law. Contrast that with the raid in Libya, which if you believe what the Libyan government is saying, and uh, again, I, a number of countries have denied assisting the U.S. You know, to save face at home, but publicly Libya is saying they uh, did not consent to the raid, weren't aware of the raid, uh, when we sent in an armed force in order to conduct a kidnapping. So if that's true, then you know, that's sovereign territory. And I question our legal authority to conduct a military operation in the sovereign territory of another country without their knowledge and consent. So it, uh, I think there are two different, uh, totally different scenarios. So let's take this Libyan scenario mm -hmm. that you're just talking about. How can we take the Libyan government at its word right now, considering the fact that, one, it's a new government that was just right. recently put into place, and two, that the violence there is still very rampant? Well, again, all we have is their word right now that uh, this was without their knowledge and consent, and they've been very vocal in their criticism. Now, you know, certainly like Pakistan, for instance, we've carried out drone strikes there where publicly the government condemns it, where apparently privately, you know, they're giving it a wink and a nod. There are no indications I've seen that that's the case in Libya, and they've been very vociferous in their their objections, which if that's true, uh, again, uh, there's no legal basis to conduct a military operation. So if there are other countries, I'm sure there are people here in the United States that other countries view as an enemy of their state. So if we can go into Libya and just abduct anyone that we choose, then why can't another country come here and do the same? Which if they did that, you know, it would be the lead story on every news network tonight. But when we do it, it's just, uh, we, you know, kind of shrug and nod. And if they came in here, I'm sure there would be hell to pay. Right. Now, we saw counterterrorism tactics shift from extraordinary rendition to mm -hmm. drone strikes in the mid to late 2000s. And we also saw this public outcry. That's why we saw that shift. Are we seeing something similar happening here, where there is an outcry over drone strikes and we're starting to see a shift towards these raids and missions? Right. Well, I think there's a downside in you know, invading the sovereign territory of another country without their knowledge or consent. I think the upside that I would take away from this is one is getting away from the drone strikes where we just go in and kill people. There is intelligence value to be gained from capturing people alive and uh, so I think that's a positive. Also as you've seen President Obama, uh, the administration has indicated that uh, al Libya will be prosecuted in federal court in New York rather than taken to Guantanamo for the military commissions. It's consistent with uh, you know the only Guantanamo detainee that's ever left Guantanamo and came to the U.S. Uh, was Galani, who was also involved in the East Africa embassy bombings and was brought to New York, successfully prosecuted with a life sentence. So I'm glad to see the president is not sending more people to Guantanamo and using our federal courts. There have been some questions raised about whether holding him uh, incommunicado on a ship, whether that jeopardizes the prosecution, and I don't think it will. I mean, I think there's already a solid case on the embassy bombings so what I hope the prosecution will do is wall off any information that we gather uh, from questioning him and just use the information that they already have. Now, I want to play a quick soundbite from a U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, speaking about this issue from Indonesia. We hope that this makes clear 
that the United States of America will never stop in its effort to hold those accountable who conduct acts of terror and those uh, members of al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations uh, literally can run but they can't hide. Uh, we will continue to try to bring people to justice in an appropriate way with hopes that ultimately uh, these kinds of activities uh, against everybody in the world uh, will stop. So there you hear him say an appropriate act of justice, which I right. think is a very key term here. If the United States is going to go after these terrorists, shouldn't they be doing this? Isn't this a term for the better instead of drone strikes that potentially cost tons of people their lives, including civilians, including women and children? Well, I think it's really a question of ends and means. I think if you look at the ends, there's no question that Al Libby was a bad guy and him being in custody and prosecuted and held accountable is a good thing. What I question are the means that we used in order to affect those ends. Like I said, invading another country with a military force to capture. I mean, it's similar, if you recall the case in Italy of Abu Omar, where we had our CIA and Air Force personnel, 23 were convicted of kidnapping in Italy for, in essence, the same type of operation we just conducted in Libya. So again, my concern is the precedent that we set, that if there's someone that we deem a threat, that we can go into any country and snatch them up. Uh, why can't other countries do that here? And we have just a little under a minute left, but I have to ask you, this is a very important day because it is the 12th anniversary of the um, our Afghanistan invasion. Do you think we are starting to see a shift away from the Middle East and toward Africa in our counterterrorism efforts? Well, it seems to be. If you, you, know, if you recall, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden had a base of operation in Africa. They were forced out and moved to Afghanistan at the time. It was, uh, you know, basically a lawless territory and easy for them to operate. And it seems now they've shifted more of their focus back to Africa. So I think that will be an increasing area of interest for the U.S. as organizations like al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda continue to uh, put down uh, roots in, in that region. Especially in uh, Mali, which we know is a huge problem right now. Those French forces we're dealing with the U.S. not so much. Colonel Morris Davis, law professor at Howard University, thank you so much for coming in and weighing in.